speaker today is Harry Hardy. He badly wanted to do his famous imitation of Charlie Chaplin, but I persuaded him to talk about typhoons and other aspects of the weather. Um, so without further ado, here's Harry. Hello? Ah, we're live. Mr. Chairman, and the rest of you lot, not often a typhoon pilot has a whole bunch of bomber types for a captive audience. I haven't prepared a sweet uh, speech for you fellas today. It's just a little show and tell. What I've done, I've taken my autobiography and made a slide of all the pictures I thought you might be interested in. So we'll show the picture on the screen and I'll tell you something about it. <clears throat> the typhoon was the first British fighter that flew 400 miles an hour on the straight and level. It had a 2200 horsepower motor swinging a 14 foot diameter four bladed prop, carried 154 uh, gallons of gas, two 1000 pound bombs, and we had four 20 millimeter cannon. We had uh, 560 rounds of cannon shells, a mixture of high explosive and armor piercing and cannons fired at 760 rounds a minute. That 2200 horsepower, by the way, is the same horsepower as a British, a BC Ferries. <coughs> that's, <laughs> that's a fighter squadron organization chart. We had uh, 27 pilots, 31 ground crew, uh, 18 aircraft when we were full up, and a mixture of trucks and jeeps and miscellaneous vehicles. The squadron leader led the squadron and the flight commanders were flight lieutenants and each flight commander had 12 pilots and they ranged from sergeant pilots up to flight lieutenants. This is the takeoff and forming up procedure. We line up on the runway in pairs and we take off in pairs and the red section would go way out and do a slow climbing turn and fly back parallel with the runway. And then the blue section would take off and do a steep climbing turn and form up on us. When we were formed up in our finger four formation, the leader would say, uh, Saffron set, our squadron call sign was Saffron. Saffron setting course over to B Baker. We'd all switch over to the operational channel from the aerodrome channel. And then we'd head for the target. When we get to the Rhine River, just before we got to the Rhine, the leader would say, uh, Saffron Battle Formation, and we'd all spread out a hundred yard line abreast as we approached the Rhine. And as soon as the, we start getting the flak on the other side of the Rhine, you guys recognize those little puffs. Then the leader would say, Saffron weave gently, and we'd all weave to avoid the radar predicted flak. As soon as we got across the uh, defended area on the east side of the Rhine, we'd reform in our finger four formation. When we were approaching the target, the leader would say, Saffron, echelon, starboard, and we'd all rack up into our bombing formation in echelon, starboard. <clears throat> As he approached the target, when he was in the right position, he would say, Saffron, going down now. And then we'd all follow him down as tight as we could in line astern. <clears throat> Strafing was a, our most dangerous job. You'd approach the target from a, a mile or so out at about a 30 degree dive. We'd pick up to around 350 miles an hour, 400 miles an hour, and then you'd open fire at 400 yards. You could only fire for one second. You, you only get away about 60 rounds, and then you had to pull up over the target. Speed was your only ally when you're strafing. Every German soldier that was in range was shooting at you. Now, the Germans put their flak positions in a triangle like this. Uh, we could only get lined up on two of them, as you see, and we'd fire on the first one, and we'd keep firing right through the second one because you couldn't stop in that short a distance. But the third guy would always be firing at you, as you can see there. I landed on the beachhead on August the 10th at B9. Can't handle the pointer and, the, and this at the same time, but you see at the top of the red line there, 
It's 37 miles from B9 to uh, Falaise, where the battle was going on when I got there. While I was flying my 10 ops on the beachhead, four of our pilots were killed, as you can see there by my two logbook pages. That's the way we lived on the beachhead. We had uh, we lived two to a tent, and we had uh, canvas cots and canvas wash basins and canvas bathtubs. That's the way we did it. We we know that you guys were all going home to a nice hot bath. Uh, some of you probably had your bat woman washing your back. Uh, <clears throat> some of the boys having a snack. That was our the little truck that used to take us and deliver us to the airplanes. On days off, we went down to Juneau Beach. This is Juneau Beach you're looking at now in August. There were a lot of motorcycles around. We were all riding motorcycles, but we had so many accidents, they took them away from us. We weren't allowed to ride them anymore. That's the, the dike at Juneau Beach. That's the dike that the soldiers climbed up. And we had to dig our own slip trenches. And look at the shovel they gave us, a square mouth shovel. <laughs> Church parade on Sunday was always out in the open, and we're all sitting on jerry cans there, you can see. And you'll see how the typhoons are spread out in the background, way up there. There's four of them in the picture. And that was to avoid inline strafing. We were spread away out. Now, we were close to Port the Army, and as soon as the Army closed the Falle Gap, they start moving north in a hurry, and we had to move with them. So we were moving from France up to Brussels, when as soon as the army had secured the, the airdrome there, and nine of us were were going up in this flight that I was in, and we uh, we got lost. <laughs> the leaders got lost. So the last thing we heard was the boss telling us to steer steer two seven zero and land when you're running out of gas. So I'm tooling along at two seven zero and down. I see the red panels on the ground down below. The, the army put two foot by four foot red panels in front of them in the most forward position, so we knew it was our guys. So I saw the panels down there, so I knew it was right over the front line. So I kept going to the west, and <clears throat> first thing I had to do was get rid of those bombs. So I picked a great big field full of cows, and I dropped the bombs safe right in the middle of the field. So somewhere in France, there's a couple of un unexploded 500 pounders down there in the ground. <clears throat> so anyway, I picked this long field. You can see how long it is because, you know, you, a typhoon goes over the fence at 100 miles an hour, stalls at 64. So you can see how far into the field I am already. And look how much field I had left out in front. <laughs> so I picked a big field, put it down there. And the farmer and his family all came running out to see me. And... <clears throat> They were glad to see a Canadian, but they couldn't understand why I couldn't speak French. So that's the family climbing all over. You see, there's somebody in the cockpit there. I wonder if those guns were safe. If a kid pushed the button with the, with the cannon fire. So anyway, that night I, I slept in the daughter's bed, minus the daughter. <laughs> On our way up to Brussels, it took us four days to hitchhike up to Brussels. And, uh, the French were so glad to see, the two of us went together, so glad to see a couple of Canadians. You can see them all gathering around us there. When we got to Brussels, this Falk Wolf 190 was sitting there, and it was booby-trapped, and when the boys pulled it down, the souvenir hunters pulled it down, it exploded and killed two of them. That's the pulverizer. Uh, now we're at Eindhoven, and you can see how the boys had to gas us up. Can you imagine the work of the ground crew to gas a typhoon with jerry cans? The Germans had the airground well camouflaged. All the buildings were covered with large nets, and they had the wooden cows and horses and <coughs> all around the place to make it look like a farm. Yeah. That's my ground crew there. <coughs> and Vic Bell on the left is from uh, uh, Peterborough, and Pete Peterson's from Port Alberni. Mm -hmm. That's to give you a feel for the size of a thousand pound bomb. It's 18 inches in diameter and about five feet long. That fellow's Roy Burton. He was a member of our group when we were in, uh, in New Westminster. Now, taxing a typhoon, you can see where the pilot's head is. You can't see too much with that big engine out in front of you. So we always had a, a ground crew man on the, on the wing if we were taxing in close quarters. You can see the German camouflage material on that building in the background. This is an anti-personnel bomb weighed 530 pounds, 
had 26 20 pound little shrapnel bomblets in it like a big hand grenade and we when we dropped them they spun on the way down and a little charge in there blew the covers off and then the centrifugal force threw those little bomblets all over the place we dropped them on the german troops any uh, place where there was a concentration of troops last time i dropped those was on the crossing of the rhine we were anti flak on the east side of the rhine and we we all dropped these on the, keep the, their heads down while the paratroopers were coming down and the gliders were coming down. I'll give you an idea what it's like in the winter time to do a DI on a typhoon. <laughs> coal looking. One of the coal jobs in the winter time was readiness at the end of the runway. We had to uh, taxi out there at first light and park and wait, to, wait for a call to take off. So you can see my ground crew on the wing there. And I used to tack, those are two 500 pound bombs on there by the way. And I used to taxi out and turn the aircraft sideways onto the wind and my ground crew used to lay down along the, on the wing on the lee side while we waited. Uh, these little girls, we were stationed in a convent in the middle of Eindhoven and every night when we came back from the aerodrome with our, in our truck, these, all these little Dutch kids were waiting for chocolates and chewing gum, etc, etc. I went over there in 2005 for the Thank You Canada celebrations and the travel agent sent this picture to the Eindhoven newspaper and they published it on the front page. Now the little girl second from the left is my little girl, Lenny. They put on a luncheon for us. Four of those little girls turned up and that's Lenny, 70 years old now. That's the pulverizers. And that's Lenny down the bottom right hand corner and myself with my armor and, and, uh, and this was the second worst hit I got. I, I was hit by flak six times while I was doing my tour. And this guy knocked my bomb rack off, so it was almost a, a lost wing there. <laughs> These are the leaflets that we dropped on the, on the German troops. Uh, four compartments in the container, and they had 800 leaflets per compartment. I never had the fun of dropping leaflets, but that's what we dropped. Now, on our days off, we used to go up to the front with cartons of cigarettes and bottles of booze. You could get anything from a soldier at the front for, <laughs> for a little booze or cigarettes. And all the way up they had these, uh, the road up to the front was known as Maple Leaf Up. And they put these funny signs all the way along. I'll let you read some of them. <clears throat> On January the 1st, the Germans carried out Operation Bodenplatt. They attacked every air room on the continent at the same time on New Year's morning. And that's our air room there. Uh, 438 Squadron was already lined up on a runway ready for takeoff. 440 Squadron were taxiing out. And they, they sure clobbered us. We lost a lot of aircraft. Didn't lose any pilots. Nobody got killed. <coughs> this is a little bit of the aftermath. Those are British typhoons on the other side of the aerodrome. You can tell that because they got white spinners. All Canadian typhoons had black spinners. My CO just finished his tour and uh, he wanted to go down to the Mediterranean on a holiday for a couple of weeks before he went back to England. So I was about five trips from the end of mine, so I decided to go with him. So the first thing we needed was a car. So I took my ground crew and we went up to the front with the usual barter. And we came to a, a compound with a bunch of cars in it, an American soldier standing guard. See? So I went up to him with a bottle of booze in my hand. I said, what would it take for you to turn your back long enough for us to tow a car out of there? He just grabbed that bottle of booze and we went in and the boys looked the engines over and picked that little ladder of work in there. And I towed it out of the place and down the road a mile or two. And then they jumped in, got the work and they got it running and they drove it back to the airport. I followed them in the Jeep. That's it there. Anyway, you can see we Canadianized it. We put Canada on the, on the doors and on the fenders so they'd know we, who we were on the way down. We drove about 2,000 miles on the trip. When we just left it on the aerodrome when we, when we left there. <clears throat> now that's uh, John Moutre's painting. I asked John to, to paint me a flight of typhoons with no war in the picture. And that's the, the one that he painted. Now you notice that we're we're racked up there in Echelon Port. Well, we never did that. We always racked up in Echelon Starboard. But in order to show 
my nose art on the air, aircraft there, <coughs> he had to draw the echelon port. So the Typhoon is the only fighter that you mount from the right hand side, the opposite side to a horse. All the fighters, even the German fighters I've seen in the museum, they mount them all from the left side. Mr. Banks, that's your effort, Bob Banks' effort on, the, on our book, Critical Moments. Bob, I got that framed and up in my office. Thank you, sir. That's Dan Ryan's sketch for Critical Moments. Uh, one little mistake on there, fellas, he put a white spinner on it. <laughs> I got that up in my office, too. Now, this is the dust cover off the Squadron History book, and then you have the pulverizer on there strafing at a roadblock. That looks the same as it looked at Falaise, with all the vehicles crowded into those multi-joints they have over in Europe, multi-road multi connections. And also uh, in the Battle of the Bulge, it was the same way. They were all stuck at the roadblocks. That's the, the wing reunion plate. Are you guys getting the message that the pulverizer was a famous airplane? <laughs> Trying to give you that idea. <laughs> Yeah, they used my pulverizer on the, on the plate. <clears throat> uh, the, the artist, Robert Bailey, drew three pictures of typhoons in his set of uh, aircraft pictures. This is the first one, Typhoon uh, Fury, and that's pulverizer two up there in the picture. That's the second one, uh, Typhoon Target, and that's the pulverizer strafing that tank with, with my wingman tailing me there, but I told him that that tank commander would never be out of that tank if he saw a typhoon coming. But <clears throat> Anyway, he asked me if he wanted to paint a picture of typhoons in the, with snow in the picture. So I told him the only time we ever had uh, snow was in the Ardennes. This is the, the, uh, the strafing run that I was shot, shot down on. That's the pulverizer too with all her nose art on her just a day or so before she was shot down. It, you see that they have bombs, the big uh, bombs are when we did a mission with 2,000 pound bombs, and the brooms in the middle are two 500 pound bombs, that's a fighter suite. So <clears throat> we had, the, the boys had a little girl with a white bathing suit on doing a swan dive out in front. It had 60 ops on it when I lost it. So we, I was straightening that tank down in the yard ends, and I was hitting the tail, a big gapping hole in the tail, and with two hands on the stick and hard rudder, I was able to climb it up to 7,000. I tried to land it on a cloud, and it, I lost control before I got down below 200. So I decided I'd have to bail out. So I, uh, I pulled the lever, and the canopy went off, and the whole right side of the typhoon goes out when you pull the ejection lever. So then I crawled out the hole on the side, slid down the wing. Luckily, I missed the tailplane and opened the chute. <clears throat> I already had a caterpillar for... Uh, for bailing out of a Spitfire. So I tried to get a bar to my Caterpillar, but they, they weren't going to give, give me a bar for it. <laughs> this is the third picture in the trilogy by Robert Bailey, and that's 438 Squadron train busting, as you can see down there. The first thing we did when we spotted the train was blow the, the boiler on the engine, as you can see the steam coming out there. And that was one of the perks of being the leader. You got to do the engine. Yeah. As soon as that train stopped, then we'd strafe all the cars. That's a picture of a, a 438 squadron dive bomb on that little bridge you see down at the bottom on the right hand side. And you guys recognize those little black puffs there. And when I used to see the red centers, you knew they were getting too close to you. Jack Meadows, I put this picture in for you. <clears throat> yeah, that must be that must be what they call a G pedal. Uh, Jack was telling me that. Some of the fighters had G pedals, which is another pedal up above the rudder pedal that you could put your feet up into so you could take more G. But uh, I don't remember them on a the typhoon. I don't remember putting my feet up there. But it shows it there, Jack. This is a little model that I was over visiting Juno Beach Center, and they didn't have a typhoon over there. So I bought this typhoon from a guy in Halifax, and we, we went to work on it, and, and uh, uh, Ted Havens changed the the coupe from the old cage coupe to the, to the modern coupe. And uh, Ted, you painted it too, didn't you? And, and uh, my son-in-law made, uh, Rick's father, made the, the prop and the bomb racks and the bombs, and my granddaughter painted the nose art on it. 
And then we took it over and delivered it to Juno Beach Center. <clears throat> it's hanging in Juno Beach right now. That model was on the internet, and I contacted the fellow, and he lived in Vancouver. So he came to the Legion for lunch, and he brought it with him and he gave it to me. So now it's sitting in my front room. <clears throat> You're getting the message that Paul Verizon is a famous, <laughs> famous airplane. <clears throat> now, Rick, we need the tape. Uh, we were coming in from an op one day, and, and the Radio Canada were there interviewing the pilots. And me being the leader, they, they picked on me for the interview. And Rick is going to play you the interview right now so you can hear what it sounds like. This is Sergeant Art Walden of the Royal Canadian Air Force reporting from a Canadian Typhoon fighter bomber wing in Holland. It's a brilliant day today in the sky, and not just the weather, but also brilliant are the many sorties that these Canadian TIFI pilots are flying. I've been talking to Flight Lieutenant Harry Hardy of Timmins, Ontario, here in the city of Ottawa Squadron dis Dispersal Hut, while he gave me a resume of his day's activities. And to pass his story along to you, we've set our RCAF microphone up in the squadron office. Here's Harry Hardy. The weather today is really CAVU. Ceiling and visibility unlimited, and we've been on the go since 7.30 this morning. I got three trips in before dinner, as a matter of fact. On the first, we were just patrolling base and checking the weather in the operational zones. The sun was just up and it was quite dark on the ground, so we couldn't see much. There was no flak, and all around it was a quiet dew. But on the second, I had quite an amusing experience. We were out to cut a rail around Crefield, and when we got there, there was a train on the track right where we were going to cut the line. I called up on the intercom saying we might as well kill two birds with one stone, get the track and the train. At that, a voice came through my headphones. Do you think that train warrants an attack? Sort of threw me for a moment till I realized it was a jerry. I challenged him, but he didn't reply, so I knew he wasn't one of ours. We went on down then to attack the train and the tracks with thousand pounders. There was heavy flak in the area and rivets. What are rivets, Harry? Uh, that's what we call small flak. It gets that name from its appearance as it comes up with you. It's on fire, actually tracer stuff, and flames past you. That was all the opposition we got, so. There were no enemy aircraft at all. I haven't seen any all day. On our third do, we were out on an armed recce and clobbered two trucks and a large camouflage wagon. The first truck was opposite outside of Kempen, where we got it right down on the deck. We were just pulling up from that attack when we spotted a large camouflage horse-drawn wagon and went down again after it. One of the boys must have cut the horses loose with the wagon, with his cannon from the wagon. There was no one around that I could see, and they went tearing down the road half the leather. Just up from the wagon, we got another truck, and that's the day's activity up till now. Harry, you were telling me about the appearance of the ground over that way. Would you pass it along for our listeners? Well, there was no enemy activity at all down below. The area over which we were attacking being partly flooded, and the German army dug in. You can actually see them down there, but they're just sitting, except for every once in a while when they throw up rivets at you. Thank you very much, Flight Lieutenant Harry Hardy of Timmins, Ontario. And we'll leave you now to get back to your typhoon and take advantage of this CAVU day. This is Sergeant Art Bolden of the Royal Canadian Air Force reporting from a Canadian typhoon fighter bomber wing in Holland. Okay, back to the pictures. Just a couple of pictures of logbooks. I guess it's a standard fighter pilot's logbook where you, you mark your ops down in one column and... You mark your casualties down in the first pilot column. And if we had a picture of uh, the lad, we put it in our logbook. So you can see that we were losing about one pilot a week. One of the, the jobs of a flight commander was to write a letter to the next of kin, usually the wife or the mother, uh, when you lost one of your pilots. And then I always got a letter back from them. I had to write four letters while I was flight commander. That's... Uh, 440 squadron at Eindhoven and that's me in the middle there. These are the four fellows on the wing from Timmins, Ontario where I come from and and Humphreys comes from over here 
Yeah, we all got together for a picture. That's the leaders of the pack. Geez, aren't we a scruffy looking lot? Not too much press in those pants, eh? <laughs> That's the two flight commanders. The middle guy is the CO. The Typhoon Memorial is built at Norwich Bocage in Normandy. That's the main memorial. It was built to honor the 151 Typhoon pilots that were killed during the Battle of Normandy. That's the wall with all 151 names on. Those are the 10 440 squadron pilots that were lost on the beachhead. Now, 450 typhoons attached, attacked the Germans on D-Day. Before the Battle of Normandy was over, we had lost 151 pilots. Uh, 41 of those were Canadians. During the whole war, we lost 666 typhoon pilots. 159 were Canadians, and we lost 21 ground crew, and three of those were Canadians. 27 of those were my squadron. My, yeah, my squadron mates. Thank you, fellas, for listening to my story. <laughs>